Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I will call this town hall to order, please. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Dan, I figured it out. We got to start having board meetings at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> it's great to see you all. Uh, obviously, it's an important discussion again today. This is the third of three scheduled town halls about the vote on the reserve fund that will start today at the end of this presentation. First thing I'd like to do is housekeeping. Please silence your phones so they don't go off during the presentation. This meeting is being recorded. Joey's back there on the camera as he always is. And I'm gonna tell you later why that's so important to all of us. I'm Matt Kambick. I'm the president of our association. I'm the lead um, target for what I call the loyal opposition in this campaign. And I'd like to ask everybody sitting at the table to introduce themselves before we start. Uh, Campbell Cheney, chair of the finance committee. Dan Lundiger, vice president. Sean Kreiderman, secretary and communications champion. Larry Santora, Assistant Treasurer. Chuck Hill, Director. I'm missing one of uh, our board colleagues. Uh, Denise Lexell's not with us this afternoon. She had some uh, medical work done this morning and uh, can't be with us. Before I get into my Where's Mark? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And Mark is not here. Thank you for reminding me. Somebody's at spring training. He's trying to relive his misspent youth, I think. Before we get into the presentation, this is the 90th day of the campaign since the reserve, the replacement reserve analysis group provided their presentation to all of us on the 13th of December. It may seem like it's been a blur to you all, uh, but it's been an interesting journey. My first thank you is to my fellow board members. We had five public meetings in January, four public meetings in February, and this is our second in March. That's 11 meetings this board has conducted across these last two and a half months. So I want to thank each of you for your contributions to this campaign. I want to thank Walter and the staff. I want to thank them for what they do every day to provide services to our community. More importantly, I want to recognize and acknowledge the efforts of Walter and his team to improve their processes and the services that they are delivering. The greatest example I've got for you is in fitness and in food and beverage. A lot of effort is being expended in both of those areas. In fitness, in the last two months, we've had revenue months of revenue uh, achievement of 31,000 in January and 37,000 last month. We just keep having record months after record months, and I think you should know that. On the food and beverage side, uh, our consultants, we just had a Chuck and I, Dan sat through another briefing yesterday. It was yesterday. Uh, regarding uh, the work that our consultants are doing uh, to integrate themselves with our staff to find efficiencies to lower our subsidies in the food and beverage while enhancing what we deliver to you as, as our customers. And finally, Walter, thanks for all the support to the board over these last 90 days and all the work that's gone in in trying to ensure that you have all the information you need to make the quality decisions that you have to make for your lives. Then I need to thank all the volunteers on our committees. We rely on residents to help govern this community, and we do that through our advisory committees. In the last 90 days, the work of these committees has been indispensable 
and being able to meet the challenges of taking this story to you. The unit rep committee, we did 10 unit town halls, and I'll talk more about those later in the presentation. The brainchild of Sean Kreiderman, our communications champion, and her and Campbell signed up to go on the road for 10, for 10 unit hall meetings. I got to sit in nine of them. I did miss one. I was at Disneyland with my grandchildren, and I can't help it, they, they wouldn't work with my schedule. The Finance Committee, obviously, the RRAG came from members of the Finance Committee, and they, their work did not stop on the 13th of December. Every time you challenged me, I had to go back and challenge them to run new numbers, to relook at all the work that we'd already done, and to confirm or deny what somebody was asking of us. So I thank Campbell and his team for continuing to support us. And later I'm gonna introduce you to Mike Brenny, the chairman of our election committee. And we have pressed them to their best because we haven't ever done this before. A special election for an assessment. And there were a lot of legal eyes to dot and T's to cross. And I'll share some of that with you later in my comments. Personally, I want to thank you all, not only in these forums, the three town halls that we've had, but the more intimate settings in the 10 unit level town halls. You really shoved us around and you pushed us to understand where you were coming from and to find answers for questions that maybe we had not thought of ourselves. I want you to know that I think because of that, you've made us a better board. And I'm confident that you've made me a better president of our corporation. So let's get at it. Today's presentation will be a bit different than our previous efforts. It's my desire to give you, our members, some new food for thought, reinforce some of the thoughts I've already provided you as we wrap up this campaign phase and enter into the voting phase. Next slide, Rick. I'll try to remember to say next slide. You've seen this slide before. This is our attorney's guidance to the board in our training that we took last year. Getting ready to re-blue the board and bring the attorney in. If we've learned anything in the last 90 days, trying to read and interpret the CCNRs in concert with law is no easy task. Our common areas that we're supposed to maintain in the eyes of our lawyers are $28 million worth of assets that are on our balance sheet. Next slide. So our bylaws state that the business property and affairs of the Saddlebrook HOA2 Corporation are managed, controlled, and conducted by the board of directors. And the CCNRs grant broad powers to the board in executing their duties on behalf of the membership. Some of you have voiced your displeasure about some of those powers. So our response, next slide. Our responsibility, protect our assets, our fiduciary obligations, isn't that a great word? Fiduciary obligations and delegation of authority. Protection of assets, what we've been talking about for the last 90 days. Fiduciary obligations. We have a duty of loyalty to the corporation, a duty of candor to you, our members, the duty to act with integrity in all of our actions and our decisions, and the duty of full disclosure. Some of you lecture me about transparency. And then we have the responsibility to delegate authority to Walter and his staff to execute the day-to-day -day activities of our corporation. Remember this, we can delegate authority, we can never delegate the responsibilities that the board shoulders because of our governing documents. Next slide. So the overriding responsibility of the board is to create policies and operate the association 
in a way that will maintain, protect, and enhance the value of the assets of the corporation and you, the members. Every decision that comes before us has to answer this question. If it doesn't maintain, protect, or enhance our assets, we should not make it. Next slide. So this is a two-way street. You, the members, should have expectations of a board. And so based over the last 90 days and all the feedback that I've been provided with, you want stable financial management. So do I. You want your assets protected. So do we. You want a well-maintained well community. Board agrees. You want consistent enforcement of the rules. We also agree. And you want effective governance. And we also agree. So I think you're going to find out that we agree on an awful lot. You the members and we the board. Man. There are about 50 seats up here. If you guys want to come sit down, if you're standing in the sides. I think they want to stand. They're looking for the exits. <laughs> Next slide. So, as I reflect back on that last bullet of effective governance, <coughs> this is the survey from last summer. And we like to refer to it because it means that we're looking at the data that you provided us to guide our actions. What you told us here was there is considerable dissatisfaction with all aspects of the board and management, with most of the satisfaction ratings substantially below the average ratings from other communities. We heard you. So we went to work last year to try to, to try to close the credibility gap that exists between board activities and the resident, the member perceptions of what we're doing on your behalf. We talked about this three-leg stool. And if you remember, back in January when the board presented its information about the strategic plan, we talked about our strategies to provide you with effective governance. And we told you it would start with a strategic plan, strategic vision. Where were we taking the community? What were we trying to become? The strategic plan was delivered to you all on 10 January of this year. The second leg of that stool was, we need to understand the future of our facilities. There's going to have to be something done to make you happy as we move to the future that looks maybe something different than it does today. And that's where the facility master plan comes in. And we're going to complete that later this year. And the third leg of the stool had to deal with financial management. This document is the 668 pages of taking the board out to the woodshed. These were your comments and suggestions about everything that's wrong and what needs to be done better. There was nothing stronger in here than the theme of financial management. We heard you. And so the third leg of the stool is about looking at the future informed by the actions of the past. What did we do right? What did we get wrong? What do we need to do different to meet the challenges of the next decade? That's what the 10-year financial plan is all about. And that's what this conversation and debate is all about. Next slide. So I've told you in the two previous meetings, I'm going to repeat it. There's an awful lot more right in our community than there is wrong. And the testament to that is the values of our homes that continue to increase. And so I'm proud to be a part of this board is trying to wage this campaign on your behalf, but we do stand on the shoulders of the board members that went before us. And so I told you we're trying to look to the future informed by the experience of the past. 
Someone asked me last night in another town hall, what lessons did we learn after the Mountain View renovation? Well, we learned a lot of lessons. But we've learned a lot of lessons about everything that's happened to our community over the last six years since we transitioned. I want you to know that. We are learning from what we've experienced and we're trying to use that information to chart a better future. So our mission statement, Saddlebrook HOA2 offers an outstanding active adult lifestyle to our homeowners and guests by combining our majestic natural desert and mountain landscapes with a broad variety of amenities and activities, well-maintained facilities, and quality services. Next slide. Our vision statement. I have to be honest with you. The board's been taken to the woodshed over this. When we sat down to debate the aspirational objective that we were gonna put out there in front of the community about what we truly wanna be when we get it all figured out and we're perfect. Perfect governance, perfect members, perfect food and beverage operations, perfect roads. When it's all perfect, what does that look like? There's gotta be a little chuckle someplace. It's never gonna be perfect. That's why it's an aspirational vision. We wanna be better than we are today. That's what you told us. What you told us was you wanted us to be collectively better than we've been. And so we wanted to move towards being a premier active adult community of choice in Southern Arizona. You can't just say that and it be true. You have to earn that. We live in a magnificent place. We have a beautiful valley that we're living here with the majestic Catalina Mountains towering over us. Most days, we have our beautiful Arizona blue sky looking down upon us. We, this community, you and I as members, have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to our amenities. Just compare our situation to that of any other nearby community. The truth is we have work to do to truly achieve this vision statement. The discussion we're having today is directly related to how we can in fact achieve this vision. Next slide please. So I've been remiss in our previous efforts with you and I can only take myself to the woodshed on this. I never talked to you about values. So I sat down this weekend and I penned the next article for the April for the record on behalf of the board. And I wrote it about our values. And I wrote it about our values because of what I got to witness over the last couple of weeks. Various situations that I found myself in where the behaviors of our members did not live up to our values. And so let me, let me spend a second on them because I've not rolled them out as well as I could have or should have. Let me take the moment now while I have this great audience to share it with. The acronym RAISE identifies our values of respect, accountability, integrity, service, and excellence. Well, what do we mean by respect? We treat each other with the golden rule. We treat each other the way we want to be, re be treated. We talk to other people the way we would like other people to talk to us. We respect people in positions of responsibility because they're working on behalf of you and I to make this a great community. That's respect. Accountability. Accountability. You want it. That's what you told us. You want the board to be accountable. You want the staff to be accountable. We all have to be accountable. And so for the staff, we're working hard to create organizational alignment so everybody on Walter's team knows precisely what we, the community, are expecting they deliver on our behalf. That's our job to resource it. 
And it's our job to ensure that they have everything they need to meet the expectations that we're levying on them. The code of conduct falls under accountability. The way that we're gonna conduct ourselves as members of our team. Resident engagement in our governance. I mentioned all the men and women serving on our, on our committees and how important. These advisory committees allow us to do important work. My friend Ian is sitting out here. Last week he was pressuring me about dog walking on the Mountain View Golf Course. Ray Adams and his team made that a reality in our community, our Rules and Regs Committee. They picked up that mantle, they heard your voice, they brought it to the board, and they convinced us it was the right thing to do. That's the power of residents helping the board do the work of the community. And fiscal responsibility is the last bullet there. We should be accountable to you all for our ability to deliver what we say we're gonna deliver, or failing to do that, explain why we fell short. Integrity, it's operating with honesty, transparency in our communications, and fairness. And fairness is a concept that this board has embraced in everything that we're doing. Service, what a magnificent community you are. The things that you are doing for your fellow man amaze me. When I think of SBCO, when I think of Senior Village, when I think of the Goose, when I think of um, the ladies, the wonderful ladies this last year, um, Quilts of Valor. I was honored to be presented with a quilt by ladies in our community that honor veterans. Most of the veterans there were 90 years or older. You talk about giving back and every one of those men was moved to tears because those ladies said thank you for what you've done for our country. That's what's going on in our community. And that's what's rich about what's here in our community. We've got a great spirit. We just gotta recognize it some days. Excellence. We gotta evaluate everything we do and we gotta get better. We gotta get better. That's how you chase the ideal of premier. Constant improvement. Someone said to me, you guys can't manage what you can't measure. No greater words were spoken. Walter and his team were working hard to develop key process indicators that we can deliver to you over time to demonstrate the improvement of operations that we're delivering on your behalf. And we need to create this culture with an expectation that we're always gonna be striving to do our best. Next slide. Values. It's hard work talking to y'all. So now I'm gonna change directions. Something that I haven't done previously that I feel compelled to do. And I wanna to talk to you just a little bit about winning leadership. It's a concept that I learned and developed and lived in 36 years of military service. Effective, effective governance requires leaders with vision. Our association must have leaders who not only take care of today, but can see further down the road to identify challenges and plans to overcome them. Campbell Cheney and Dale Lehman are two such leaders. They partnered together in 2023 to pull together the best financial minds we have that have and or are still serving our community regarding financial management and planning and those that have the deepest knowledge of our reserve study. Next slide. So over the last several weeks as Sean and Campbell have been on their road show, Campbell throws out stats. I had three CPAs, I had this, I had that. Let me explain to you just a little deeper. Campbell's a chartered financial analyst. 
who made his mark in the world in um, uh, acquisitions. He's got a very keen mind, a tremendous asset for our community. Dale Lehman is a certified public accountant who served as last year's finance committee chairman. Joyce Howard, another certified public accountant, a former board treasurer and former chairperson of the finance committee. Pat Lenz, certified public accountant, former chairperson of the finance committee, currently sitting on the finance committee. Next slide. Then there was Rhett Benedict, our rocket scientist. Dr. Benedict, a PhD in physics, former board treasurer, current advisor to the finance committee, and a former corporate executive. And then we had Ray Adams, who has multinational corporate executive experience with vast budget experience, who currently serves on the finance committee, as well as serves as the chairman of our rules and regulations committee. John Howard, another multinational corporate executive with vast budget experience, who's also currently serving on the finance committee. And Duff Fletcher, and he's the odd man out. Duff's an engineer, but he's also a current member of the finance committee. And there ain't much golf being played by these folks. I say that because a lot of people think the board has been poisoned by the fact that five of the seven board members play golf. I want you to know that's not the case with the replacement reserve analysis group. Next slide. So the RRAG, I'm gonna call them the RRAG because that's a heck of a lot easier than saying replacement reserve advisory group. The RRAG was given their mission and their guidance initially by Campbell. Their job was to chart the most efficient course for the association to pursue in meeting the 45 to 50 million dollar reserve plan funding requirement over the next 10 years. Over time, that guidance expanded to also include the charge to keep our future dues as low as possible so we could again become competitive regarding annual dues. The cost of home ownership does have an impact on property values. Next slide. So Campbell and Dale organized the RRAG back in May of 2023, and the work began in earnest in June. They met and worked the problem over the next seven months, June through mid-December. On the 13th of December, they reported the findings of their work. And they delivered to us, the board, and you all, the community, the fruits of their labors. They delivered three options. One option was designed for this board to stand up and get slapped around for 90 days. That was supposed to be funny. Yeah, you weren't on this side of it. And the other two options were, what would happen if the optimum option was not embraced by the majority of the community. The board still has the obligation to meet the 45 or $50 million funding requirement for the reserve over the next 10 years. Next slide. So this team had a integrated financial model. That's sexy. But what it allowed them to do was to, to do a lot of things and consider a lot of things. First thing it did was it laid out the revenue sources. How do we generate revenues on the operations side or the reserve side? What role does the community fee allocation play? And what about investment performance? Expenses. We have expenses on the operations side and the reserve side. And we have to fund those requirements. And they had to examine and study 
how we were going to do that. And they had to connect all this to dues as one of those revenue sources. And of course, we always have a year in cash balance objective that we're trying to hit. Next slide. So they produced 10 options. They conducted exhaustive analysis, a very rigorous process in pursuit of providing us with the most effective and efficient strategy to meet their task. Along the way, something called discovery learning took place. As they were testing various hypotheses, they discovered ways to impact lowering dues for the future. This integrated analysis of looking at our financial strategy for the next decade was based on reasonable assumptions. And ladies and gentlemen, the point that I'm trying to make is that the options that were provided to the board and to you all were the best expert advice available to this community. Next slide. So let me spend a moment on member voice. Never in the history of Saddlebrook HOA 2 has greater effort been given to securing member voice. It started with the survey results last year. And over the last 90 days, we've had 254 members post comments, 43 members posted more than once, and 765, or 64 comments were compiled and summarized by my good friend, Ray Adams. Ray, I think you're a rock star, man. What you do for this community is incredible, and I salute you, sir. This is our third town hall. We had more than 750 residents participate in the first two town halls. Campbell and I were working on this presentation over the weekend, and we went to YouTube. The first town hall had more than 1,600 views. The second town hall had 883 views. Joey, thank you very much for what you do for this community. We've conducted 11 unit town halls which touched in excess of another 750 residents. The Sean and Campbell Roadshow. It turned out to be a magnificent experiment where we got to learn the importance of meeting with you all in more intimate settings where you felt comfortable to express yourselves. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the efforts of the loyal opposition in both social media and in print. Next slide. One area where the member voice had an impact on this board was in the discussion that surfaced about the use of capital improvement funds to assist in lowering the assessment ask on members. For those of you who may not know, we have $1.4 million in our capital improvement fund as we sit here today. But the board didn't do that. Instead, it looked at a different option of taking the mechanism that funds the capital improvement fund, the community improvement fee. And we took the recommendations of the RRAG and we increased them. And we committed the next four boards if this plan is passed by you all, to funding the reserve fund with 100% of the community improvement fee over the next four years. That action was directly related to community voice. And that's why we were able to reduce the ask from $4,600 to $4,200. Next slide. So, because of the questions, because of the comments, because of the tenor in some corners of the community, I asked the board to be able to establish some foundation on what we were going to stand on 
as we represented our logic to you all. We created what we call option three tenants. We acknowledge the fact that the plan the RRAG gave us under option three is gonna fund approximately $33 million of requirements over the next five years. And $14 million on the five years following that. We were committed to producing the lowest dues possible and feasible to our planning efforts. I think we have universal agreement on this one. We wanted to pay off the Mountain View renovation loan. And the RRAG, in their deliberations, and one of the uh, discovery learning outcomes from their efforts was the fact that if we moved the preserve golf course renovation forward two years, it would have a positive impact on lowering future dues. We wanted to pay cash going forward. That's what the RRAG model did. The RRAG model deal plan, option three, allows us to meet the $33 million requirement over the next five years and pay cash in doing it. And we also had to make some other commitments. We had no plan to sell, close, and or repurpose either golf course. That was a unanimous decision. All residents will be treated the same, a unanimous decision. All amenities will be treated the same regarding maintenance, another unanimous decision. And the capital improvement fund will be preserved and used in accordance with its stated purpose. Next slide. So we live in a common interest community where the interests are not so common. And so I put this little chart together to try and give you a visual depiction of what, what we're experiencing in this debate. The green arrow going this way, this way, points to the corporate responsibility of the board shoulders. The yellow arrow going that way points to members' responsibilities to the corporation. In case you didn't know that, when you're a member of this corporation, which you become by gaining ownership of your home, you have obligations to the corporation as well. Those are to pay your annual POAs, any special assessments that may be approved, and to obey the rules. And so sometimes I think we have an expectations management golf that we have to learn to bridge. We have to stop talking past each other and understand what really has to be done. At the board level, we have to maintain, protect, and enhance all the association assets and your home values. We don't get to choose. 764 comments and the actions of the loyal opposition tell us that you're willing to choose actions that the board cannot because they will adversely hurt the community. Golf is expensive. I acknowledge that. 46 cents out of every dollar in the reserve fund is focused on golf. That's a fact. I can't change it. It's unpopular and it's unavoidable. But what I'm suggesting to you all is we have to get past this. If we're gonna stand up here and tell you that we can't get rid of a golf course, then our obligation is we have to maintain that golf course. Next slide. So let me take a moment to kind of walk you through some forward thinking. I put a little timeline together for 2024 through 2027 through the eyes of option three and I'm gonna throw in some of the loyal opposition. 
And so in 2024, we're going to do this assessment vote. When it passes, we'll pay off the Mountain View loan. And this year, the Mountain View golf course will open. 18 holes will play. So there are activities related to the preserve rebuild, which has become the lightning rod for this debate. Did I mention that we were going to spend $33 million in the next five years? And $9 million of that is the golf course? I haven't heard anybody talk to me about the rest of that requirement, except for the Mountain View loan repayment. So let me start at the bottom arrow. You have a piece of paper in your hand that Bob and company handed out called the, called the pause. And the pause wants us to wait for a year. The pause wants us to analyze um, the Mountain View performance. And the pause also authors um, the idea of we should sell the preserved golf course. We're not going to do that. And so failing that, they want us to consider, uh, okay, rebuild it, but make it less than what it is today. If you make a commitment as a board member that we're going to treat all of our assets the same, then you have to treat the golf course like you do every other asset. So the preserve renovation planning. Residents have taken the master plan, and I will admit, the cost estimate looked at the master plan. That's not a detailed construction plan that's gone through any vetting process at all. It hasn't. And if I've learned any lessons as we move to the future, we're going to have to be very public about what we're doing to renovate the preserved golf course. We have 15 months, 12 to 15 months, before the next decision point associated with doing anything related to the preserve renovation. Plenty of time, plenty of time to do the detailed work that needs to be done to create the plan to demonstrate to this community precisely what each renovation requirement is and what its cost is going to be to our community. The analysis of the Mountain View Golf Course, I put that arrow up there. The decision point for option three, the decision point on hiring a construction company is some 27 months away. That's two years of analysis on the Mountain View golf course performance. And so if you want to pause before we have to make decisions, there's a 27 month pause. And so what I'm saying to you is that we can do all the things Many of the things that the loyal opposition is asking, we just can't do it with less money. Next slide. So you've heard me long enough. I'm going to turn the rest of this presentation or the next section of this presentation over to Campbell Cheney, and he's going to talk to you about our financial uh, status as it exists today and how option three impacts that. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next slide. So I want to start off by just showing to you our financial position as of the end of January, our cash and investment position. I've been hearing come to my attention that we're in financial difficulties. And I want to just put that to rest with this next slide. Next slide. This is our cash position from our banks and brokers. So this is what we had in the bank and in our broker statements at the end of January. You can see our total cash investments for the community is $13.2 million. It's divided about $6.4 million into our operating fund about 5.4 million into our reserve fund at the moment, and about 1.4 million in our capital improvement fund. Now this is our high water mark. Our dues are paid in December and January, and then spent for the next six months. So what you see is 
the cash is going to start being used month after month after month. We burn about $500,000 to $700,000 a month on average for our operating fund. And for the reserve fund, we burn approximately, on average, about $400,000. So for the reserve fund, which is why we're talking about this today, 400,000 times six is $2.4 million. You subtract that out, and we get close to what our best practices tell us we should be at about $3 million in the reserve fund. And that $3.2 million at the bottom is basically the dues we collected over the course of January. And I wanted to point that out. It's not really part of the reserve fund conversation today, but I want to point that out. Next slide. So we were charged as the replacement reserve analysis group to create a 10-year financial funding plan to meet the reserve expenditure requirements over that period of time through 2033. Now, we only have so many levers we can pull from a revenue source. We can do dues annually, compounded if we just use dues. We can use assessments, two types of assessments, a board approved assessment, which can only be $300 or less per year without going to the community. Anything over $300, a community vote is needed, which is why we're here. Or we can use debt, which we have in the past, or a combination of those three. We also have the opportunity for looking at expense project timing. We could pull projects forward, we can push them back. We've looked at that. Our mission basically was to chart the most efficient course for the association to meet the 45 to $50 million reserve plan funding requirements over 10 years. And to accomplish the first task and to hold back dues increases to as little as possible. That basically means we, got to need, we need assessments. Next slide. So we built integrated models, complicated models, that incorporated both operating, reserve fund, and community improvement fee dynamics. It's a dynamic model, very complicated, as I said. If you change the cell in one, it changes the cell in other and spits out different outcomes. What we discovered through discovery learning with this hypothesis testing, basically what ifs. What if we decided to pay off the Mountain View loan early? What if we decided to move things forward, such as the preserved golf course renovation? What would happen? We discovered that paying off the Mountain View loan early will lower future dues because we have to put an assessment in place. Putting the golf course renovation at the preserve in 2027 rather than split it in, in 2026 and 2029, putting it together could lower or could see, using construction cost inflation could save money rather than doing it in 2029 um, because of the inflation factors. Next slide. So we're faced with 32 or so million dollars, 33 million dollars basically being needed in the first half of the decade and only 14 million after that. So the second half, 14 million. That creates a hump. And how do we get over this hump? The best way to do it is more or less using an assessment, get paid this, and once we get past this hump, we're gonna have a lot of flexibility and less pressure to raise dues in the future. But we gotta get over this hump. A real world example of this is HOA-1. Once HOA-1, starting in 2005, for those who went to the unit meetings, they had nine years of assessments, small assessments, but nine years worth, and they did dues increases. In fact, their dues increased 92% over those nine years. But once they finished with that, they didn't increase dues for five years. Zero increase, because they're over their hump so they didn't need to increase the dues. I think we have a plan to make that happen. Next slide. So what does option three provide? Well, basically, it's just a 10-year financial plan for the reserve funding, for the reserve expenditures. Like I said, 45 to $50 million. I think we're gonna spend that money. To, what we need to do is figure out how we're gonna spend that money, the best and most efficient way to do that. Through discovery learning, we realized that paying off the Mountain View loan early, three and a half years early, 
will provide for less, and less pressure and lower dues increases in the future. Funds for the preferred golf course renovation in 27 versus in two instances for our reserve study, 2026 and 2029, could save on construction costs because of inflation. If you do something earlier, it's gonna save from doing it later, which costs more because of inflation that we've all been experiencing the last few years. Plus, funding it now, and over a, a, a fund, a $4,200 assessment, payable over four years, gives residents the opportunity to retain their investments, earning money until it's needed. So we're not gonna ask for your money up front, we're doing it over four years, so you can keep your investments as investments until the money's needed. Next slide. So paying off the Mountain View debt early in 2024, if this assessment goes through, we could probably pay this off before the September 9th, 2024 payment. If we can do that, we can save $558,000 in future interest. That's a hard number. It also relieves us from having to have $3 million at the uh, lending bank, which then we could take and reinvest at market rates. Next slide. I'll talk a little bit about the preserve renovation doing in 2027. Right now, our 2022 reserve study, which is online, I'll tell you how to get there if you want to look at it. It's on our home, go to the bottom of our home page. There's something called quick links. Click on that. Click on financial reports. Then click on other reports and there it is. Three clicks from the home page and you're at our reserve study. All 264 pages of it. This reserve study has the preserve renovation in two phases. One in 2026, which has replaced the greens and the irrigation pump a system pump, the pump station, and then the rest of it done in 2029. The irrigation system, the bunkers, the practice range, the tees, the turf reduction, it's all there in the reserve study. But you're gonna lose revenue in two different times. You're gonna lose revenue from course closures in 26, and you're gonna lose revenue from course closures in 2029. It also assumes debt, so more debt in our future, based on the reserve study. And that's for the irrigation system. Doing the reserve, the preserve, the preserve renovation 2027, we're doing it all at once. One problem with doing it in two different phases from the reserve study is available labor. It's tough to get labor to come to Tucson to work. If you get him here, you want to keep him here and do it all at once. You lose revenue from only one course closure instead of two, and the construction cost saves given inflation factors. If it's 3% a year, which is our assumption, you can save 6% by doing it in 2027 versus 2029. So what does all this mean? Here's a picture. This is option three in one slide. Now I'll describe it for you. The green bars are the money coming in, the assessments and dues. The orange bars are basically the planned expenditures. So if you look at 2024, the far left orange bar, that's the regular reserve fund expenditures plus the retirement of the debt. You look at the big bar in 2027, the orange bar, that's doing the preserve renovation. And then after that, you can see that it falls off dramatically. The red line is our ending balance for our reserve fund. It never really goes below our best practices of $3 million plus a small inflation factor going forward. But what it does do, it ends at about $6 million in 2033. Future boards can decide not to put that much money in the reserve fund, they could reallocate that to the operating fund. That gives them the flexibility to do that. And one final line is that literally, probably can't even see it, but there's a tiny little blue line right near the bottom that is cash flow from operations. It's all positive for the next 10 years. And that's an important fact that we're running our operations cash flow positive. Option three does that. And the reason the cash flow isn't more is we're a nonprofit. We're not trying to make money on our operations. We're just trying to break even as a nonprofit. Next slide. So compare and contrast. Option three versus option one and two. Option three benefits. No debt, no future debt expected. Provides the lowest annual projected dues increases among those three options. Consolidates the reserve renovation to one project down from two. 
Next slide. What is option one? Option one is five $300 assessments and one $150 board approved assessments. Future debt, more debt. The reserve irrigation system would be that debt used. Higher dues increases in option three. And option two, six $300 annual board approved assessments. No future debt expected. The highest potential dues increases among the three options. And there's no loan payoff for either of those two options. You gotta keep the loan to maturity. Next slide. So, I lost my place. Here's a breakdown of option three, the payment period. You can see 2024 is $1,000 payable July 15th due July 15th, I should say, and then it goes down from 2025, 26, and 27, $500 each semi-annual POA period. That's the breakdown of the payment. I believe that's the last I have. I have one more? Oh yeah, the risks. What are the risks? I'll just skip to the bottom. What are the un unknown unknowables? The unknown unknowables, we don't know what future boards are gonna do. It is up to them. The board is staggered. We have three members going off the board, or if they don't come up for re-election this year, they go off the board. We have three new board members in 2025, two members after the year after that, and two members the year after that. So what we have is future boards may not take this plan. They may have their own plans. That is a risk. Um, they make decisions every year. There's also asset failures, road failures. If we don't have them, we need the money for road failures. We had one at the Overlook just a few weeks ago. That money had to be come up with um, quickly. A couple hundred thousand dollars, I'm told, is to fix that. Um, but by and large, is basically, this is a 10-year plan that provides some stability and some guidance to future boards. Anyway, that's what I have. Thank you. Thanks, Campbell. Appreciate you giving us that recap. I'm gonna take a few minutes and walk us through our special election process. I wanna introduce you to two people that are gonna play a very important role in our upcoming election. The first is Mike Brenny. He's the chairman of our election committee. This is Mike. And uh, the rest of his committee is Cash, Striplin Cash. I saw you standing back over there. Greg Ballard here? No. Uh, Greg Ballard is the third member of our election committee. One of the options you're going to have as we walk through this process is you're going to be able to vote electronically as you have for board elections in this election as well. And we do that through Vote HOA Now. And Charlie Shawless, our administrative assistant to Walter, is the uh, point of contact for our corporation. With that, uh, with that organization. And I'm gonna invite Mike to talk to you a little bit about our process. Okay, Joey, next slide, please. I'm Mike Brenny. I'm a 20-year resident of here in Saddlebrook. Love it here. Uh, I don't cheat at golf. I don't cheat at cards. I don't cheat at dominoes, and I don't cheat at elections. So you're in good hands. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, we, tomorrow morning at 12.01, you're going to get an email. So a lot of you will probably be, still be up by then. So you're going to get an email. We'll allow you to vote electronically. Also tomorrow in the mail, they're going to be putting in the mail tomorrow a... Today? Okay, they will go out today. Is a notice of an election meeting that we're going to be having. It's noted up there. That's required by law for us to have. With all the exhibits and all the information concerning what we're doing. Also will be included is a paper ballot. So you're gonna have the op op option to either vote electronically or by paper ballot. 
and your paper ballot that will be included in your mailing, you can do one of three things. You can mail it in, you can deposit it in a box at the reception for HOA 2, or you can bring it to the meeting that we're having on the 30th of April. And so those are the options. Those ballots at the office are taken every evening. They're taken and put into a safe. And they will remain there until we open those on the 30th. Now it's still flexible how this is. We don't know how many paper ballots. We don't know if they're gonna be counted at that meeting or not. It's still a little flexible here. We're gonna see how many paper ballots we have. But traditionally, at least in the board elections, well over 90% of the votes we get are done electronically. Now Charlie is the only person that can communicate with the company, it's called Vote HOA Now. And Charlie's the only one, no member, no board member can have contact with them. It's part of the security. Just so you know, HOA One uses the same system. I met with their chair, they're totally confident, we're totally confident, it's totally safe and secure. So that's what I know by now. Charlie, do you have anything else you wanna add? So the attorneys have been involved, we think we're following all the rules, regulations, so I think we have things well in hand. So please get to vote, please get your neighbors to vote. Traditionally, for board elections, we only have about 40% participation. HOA 1, traditionally, has 60% participation. So I want to shoot for at least 60, because we want to make sure that the majority of homeowners here are sending the message what we want to hear. So please, get out to vote, encourage your neighbors to vote. We really need to get back the feedback as to what direction you want the board to take. Okay, thank you. I've asked um, Charlie, one of the options that Mike told you about was dropping your ballot off at the admin office. And I've asked Charlie to explain the process that she's put in place to manage and secure those ballots. So um, I do manage the admin team um, at HOA2. And you will find at two o'clock this afternoon, they put out the ballot box. We do have copies of ballot there, although every one of you will be getting one in the mail. So you can wait and, and get that and use that if you'd like. Um, every evening we do take the ballots out of the box and we do put them in the safe in my office so i know mike um touched on that but matt just wanted me to you know go over that again and um so it is it's really secure so we just want everyone to be relaxed about the ballot ballot process it's um, the vote, voting process. It's going to be fair, and uh, we got it under control. Yeah, I want to stomp one more time about the last bullet. Please understand that there's only one vote per lot. Um, don't vote in multiple ways. If you vote in multiple ways, your vote will not count. So important that you know that. Next slide. So how did this process get put together? Our CCNRs have requirements of us, and state statute has requirements of us, and with the help of our attorney, Jason Smith, we were able to meld together the requirements in both to put together the plan that we're executing. Article seven of section five of the CCNRs, uh, special assessments must be approved by the affirmative vote of a majority of the votes cast in person or by proxy at an annual meeting of the members of the association or at a special meeting called for that person. Purpose. 30 April is the special meeting called for this purpose. Next slide. So what does state statute require of us? 
It requires that you receive a notice, and it requires that that notice is sent through the U.S. mail. And so that notice is going out today, uh, which is going to tell you about the 30 April meeting. You don't have to wait till the 30th of April to vote. You can vote any time between the time you receive your ballot and 30 April. So we have to have a meeting because the CCNRs require it. We've got a mail out notice because state statute requires it. Next slide. So our council's advice, uh, conduct the special meeting, uh, mail the meeting notice. He also suggested that we send the absentee slash paper ballot to you. In that process, you get an envelope that you vote. You know, just like you do in the other election, you put it into an envelope that you can seal, you mail it back, drop it off at the office. Council recommended we use the full 50 days that the law affords for this type of uh, uh, election, and we chose to do that. Next slide. So today's day one of our 50-day election cycle. It kicks off because two things are going to happen. The notice mailing will occur today, and an email blast will go out this afternoon uh, with the same information that you will receive in the mail. Uh, the, uh, the electronic window opens tomorrow because uh, I didn't want them to get out in front of us today and all the other actions we were doing. Uh, after midnight, they're allowed to send the button and, and push out the electronic process. Next slide. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. Can I add one, just one thing? One of the things that's mentioned here is proxy and... Uh, comes up, means a lot to a lot of different people. But the reality is, by state law, you cannot transfer your voting right of your lot to anyone that doesn't have ownership of that lot. So when you get your ballot, you can have someone deliver your ballot for you, if you like, once you've put it into a sealed envelope, that person can take it to the HOA office or bring it to the meeting. <clears throat> but do you cannot transfer your right to vote by state law in this process. So I just want to be clear for everyone that you can do anything you want. If you sealed it in an envelope, have someone drop it off for you, that's all good. But you can't transfer your right to vote uh, from outside of someone owning a lot. Thank you for providing that clarification, sir. He spent more time with the lawyer than I have. Okay, day 50, that's our last day. That's when we'll do our special meeting on the 30th. Uh, I have no idea how many people will show up on the 30th. Uh, we'll put together uh, the process that allows you to come in to receive uh, the paper ballot and the envelope to put your ballot in and to hand it over to the election committee. Uh, as soon as I close the meeting, they will begin counting the ballots. Mike writes big checks. He told me he didn't care how much sleep he lost. He was going to get those ballots counted that day. We'll see. Uh, and so I gave him a day. I said, you know, if you could just tell us the next day, that would be good. But um, that's a low, uh, that's a... Uh, just our plan. The 50-day voting cycle opens today, ends 30 April. Uh, we hope to have the results in your hands by the 1st. Somebody's going to ask me about the ropes and lots. So today, build out is 3,292 homes. We currently have 3,186 homes. That means there's 106 lots left that ropes and owns. He gets three votes per lot, that's 318 votes. I've been in contact with Jack Sarson. We had two conversations yesterday. Jack, excuse me, Dan Linegar sent Jack all of our election information to go to their legal counsel. That happened yesterday. I have no idea if 
Robeson is going to vote in this election, and if they are, how they're going to vote. Next slide. So, somebody's going to ask me questions about liens, and somebody's going to ask me questions about a number of things related to uh, what happens if I sell my property uh, when you guys pass this thing. And so I'm trying to get out in front of it, and I'm, I'm going to do my very best to explain this meager flow chart that I presented. The top left box is you, the member who decides to sell your home. You'll be working with the title company who will send a demand letter to the HOA that goes into our comptroller's office. That demand letter caused, caused things to happen within our community. The comptroller's responsibilities are to look at your lot and what balances are against that lot. At the same time, ALC plays a role in this process. That's the ALC inspection and approval. That process typically takes up to seven days. Once they complete and give it back to the comptroller, they're prepared to do what they do next, and that's send nine forms back to your title company, at which they lay out all the costs related to that lot. That would include the uh, community improvement fee, any POA you may owe or assessment, et cetera, or they will look at a re, uh, accounts receivable and look at if you have an outstanding bill for your restaurant usage or whatever along those lines. Any charges against that lot will be identified back to the title company. The title company then does their dance with the buyer, seller, and all the stuff that goes on in there that I have nothing to do with. And then we'll get the close of escrow, and we're done with close of escrow, the title company sends the funds that lot owed back to the HOA. So hopefully I did a good job of explaining that process. There is... Wait, wait, wait. Can we wait to the Q&A and I'll answer all the questions. Um, as maybe I'm going to answer it right now. Next slide. So, I've been working real hard trying to stay in trouble, I mean out of trouble, with members by answering their questions. So these are some questions that we've received, and I know the answers are accurate because the lawyer sent us back the information that says that that's the right answer. So, Whoever the owner of record is on July 15th will be responsible for the full $4,200 assessment, although they can negotiate the amount among themselves as the buyer and the seller on who pays how much. It must, however, be satisfied to clear the lien before the title transfer. Well, as I said, the lien is implied through our CCNRs. There is no lien on your property, okay? But the answer is yes. Whoever the owner of the property was on 15 July, they are responsible for the $4,200 assessment. So then the next question was, therefore, I am assuming if I sell my house in December of 2024, I would already have paid $1,000 and the remaining amount, $3,200, would remain due as a lien on the property and take it out of sale proceeds or, of course, could be part of a negotiation, hama, hama, hama. It would, however, have to be paid in full before the transfer of title. The remaining 30, the answer, the remaining $3,200 are funds the property owes the HOA. The HOA informs the title company of that amount. The title company does its work with the buyer-seller. At close of escrow, the title company forwards funds owed to the HOA to the HOA. There is no recorded lien on the property. However, the CCNRs are technically the lien and the property owes the $3,200 to the HOA. Question. Regarding ropes and new home sales, the same rules apply, right? Whoever is the owner of record on or before July 15th will be responsible for the full $4,200 assessment. 
And the answer was yes, our CCNR has established these rules. All ropes and new home sales that close between 1 January and 15 July will be responsible for the full $4,200 assessment because they closed what it's called, they became an accessible property under our CCNRs. And finally, for new preserved home closings after July 15th, no part of the $4,200 assessment will need to be paid by new owners, even though the assessments will be continuing across the next four years for all the rest of us. And the answer is yes. If they don't own their property by July 15th, this assessment would not apply to them. Next slide. So let me offer you my final thoughts and we'll go to questions and comments. I want to go back to the three-legged stool. We're working to improve governance in our community. And I want to remind you of the board's role and the member's role. We are working tirelessly to enhance your perception of us as a body. To do that, we know that planning is essential to gain your confidence. And so is the collaboration between members and our governance apparatus, the board and the staff, and the board and our advisory committees. Option three provides a path forward for our community. And we think it's sound governance to have such planning for you. So why do I support option three? It produces something we've never had, a 10-year financial strategy connected to the reserve fund. It's based on prudent assumptions. It accomplishes the task of fully funding the known reserve requirements by paying cash and it controls future dues increases. It ensures that this board has a competent plan to gift to future boards. We can create continuity of effort and purpose and it starts us on a path to predictability and stability and it's my fondest hope to better relationships between you all as members and us as the board that serves you. I thank you for your time. We will go to questions and comments. Um, like always, when you come down, uh, name and unit lot number if you can, please. And we're going to limit comments to two minutes. Uh, we're going to be pretty specific on that today, I think. We had some that ran over significantly in the last one, so I think we all like to get out of here at some point in time. So anyway, uh, two minutes, but thank you very much for your patience. Hank. Hi. Hank Walter, Unit 46, Lot 126. This is going to take a little bit more than two minutes of my comments. First of all, I want to thank the board for what they've done with the transparency and work that they've done since they've taken, uh, sorry, since they've taken and gotten attention to ensure the value and stability of the Saddlebrook. At present, we live in some certain uncertain conditions. The inflation rate is the highest as it's been in 30 years, and the price of gas and food isn't even factored into that rate. As retirees, this doesn't give us a calming feeling. I have done some smart things and some dumb things in my life, but the two smart things I've done was marry a beautiful, smart woman 61 years ago, and number two, deciding to invent and, to, and retire in Saddlebrook 20 years ago. Having a home in a bit is the biggest investment that we make when things break or get outdated, dated, we fix whatever needs to be fixed to maintain and improve our investment. We live in the desert, and for us to have grass, flowers, and shrubs, we water these items, both on our individual properties and in the HOA, 
which we also own. It's called maintenance. We have a continued turnover of homes, either because we have a need to sell and be close to a family as we age, or we can, in order to continue in this community. We've worked very hard to reach the age of retirement and found Saddlebrook to be the place to do the things that we dreamed of. In attending the town meeting unit, town meetings, unit meetings, and watching the videos that have listened to the comments that I've seen the flyers and postings come from homeowners. Some who were previously members of various HOAs, even members of the boards. I was astonished that those people could be so emphatically against what we are being asked to vote on to maintain our chosen future lives. If you moved here from these other places, there was a reason. And I just don't understand why you, Hank, why, we're going why to you don't want to live up to it. Thank you, Hank. Oh, come on. This has happened four or five times. I know, I know. Back. Yeah. Back All right. Kind of hard to figure out which way to stand here. Bob Eater, uh, Unit 32, Lot 39. Since my name was evoked, I thought I had to get up here and say something. Um, I want to say both in, uh, half said in writing and, and say in person that I deeply respect the time and energy the board has put into all of this, especially Matt. I, I've rarely seen anybody this energetic. Uh, this has been a long campaign. In fact, my argument would be that this has been pretty much a campaign. This is an unusual town hall. Uh, I guess I finally am up to talk. I thought town halls were supposed to be voice of the residents. But we had another campaign speech today about voting for option three, which was a, basically fixed before we, they even met on the, in December to talk to us about this problem. They were going to go with option three, and that's where they're going. In, on February 15th, I sent a detailed two-page email to every member of the board asking them to consider a fourth option pay off the Mountain View loan. We agree to that. Let's, let's get the assessment, get that done. And let's give ourselves some time to think about how we're gonna go forward with this expensive preserve renovation. Now clearly, it, it need, I, you know, Matt and I are, are golf buddies, we're good friends. I, it, the, the, the bunkers need to be fixed. The course needs to be updated. I'm, I understand that. It doesn't need to be totally redesigned but it does need some serious community conversation about our ability to sustain two golf courses and to be able to uh, fix it in a timely fashion. Matt's even admitted that we've got at least two years. Well, why don't we figure out what we're gonna do and then ask for that money? So that's, that, that's really what we have said. Um, so I find it interesting that, and I'll ask Chuck and Larry who have not supported option three, to, to tell us, has the board, up till the two minutes that, that Matt mentioned my name, have they considered option four? Has there any been serious conversation about option four or the arguments for it, of which Matt only partially represented some of those? And finally, the last thing I'll say, it, okay, I'll just walk Thank you, Bob. On, but I wanna know if uh, Robeson was asked to vote yes for this measure. Thank you, Bob. Andrea Mulberg, Unit 42 and Unit 28. Hank and I live in the preserve and bought a second smaller home on the Mountain View course for when I'm widowed. Thank you for your hard work. You're amazing, and I'm sorry that you've gotten abuse for your efforts to protect our wonderful community. You and I agree on the need to retire the loan, build our resources, keep Saddlebrook highly attractive so we all enjoy living here and make Saddlebrook too highly competitive to protect our home values. That's where we talk about money, dues, and assessments. Like you, I see the need to maintain our roads, buildings, pools, courts, courses, dance venues, art studios, libraries, meeting spaces, etc. And we need to support amenities, new and old, even if we don't use them ourselves. 
Like most of us, I bought here because it's a beautiful, active adult community, not because it has the best golf courses or most holes in the area. Golf courses make Saddlebrook pretty, but the majority of us don't golf. Bottom line, we need to find a way to be beautiful and fiscally viable. The staggering golf and F&B losses aren't sustainable. Spending 9.5 million on redesigning the preserve course and doing it sooner rather than later doesn't appear financially sound. Half of our operating expenses are going to golf and we're still reeling from the 6.8 million spent on Mountain View without our approval. Matt, you told me that we need to attract more golfers. As a management consultant, I've seen people and organizations invest heavily to attract customers only to find that there wasn't a market. Communities are closing courses for, or making them smaller because they are so expensive. Again, I want Saddlebrook 2 to be beautiful and my friends to golf. Let's find financially feasible ways to protect home values. I'm voting no because it assumes that I don't have Thank you, Andy. Uh, yeah, uh, Terry Lee, Unit 17137. I just want to start um, the day I was born. Can I get, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your unit, I'm sorry. Unit 17, Unit 17, Unit 137. I just want to start the day I was born. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, this is just a question for the board, and one of it is, the, again, we recognized your work. I've been on a million committees, and, and I appreciate it. Um, it's just a water issue. I don't know that this has been discussed. Um, how much do the golf courses use in water? Do you guys know? Uh, well, I do. They use 1,000 acre feet of water per year. How much of that is reclaimed water, or re, should I say effluent? You know, we don't have, I, I don't have these facts in front of me, I'm okay, sorry, I'm, but no. if you have the answer, keep on trucking. No, 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 I'm not criticizing. I'm just asking, water is an issue, it's going to be an issue. And I want the public to know how much water is pumped out of the ground for the golf courses. That's one third of what all Saddlebrook uses in water. And those documents are ADS. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah, I didn't know that, so thank you very much. We do use effluent. We do use effluent. Not all, but some. A little over 11% effluent is okay. all that's used on the golf course. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I, I guess you can hear me. My name is Howie Fagan in Unit 30. And I just want to talk a little bit about the Mountain View Golf Course. We've been here since 2002. That's 22 years. And thank you. And being here for 22 years, I, I'm an occasional golfer. And I've golfed at, at, at Mountain View and the conditions were terrible. That was before Ropeston was there. I've gone to other courses when people would say to me, where are you from, HOA2? And I would say, have you, gone, have you played at Mountain View? And he said, yes, and it is terrible. The conditions were terrible then, they were terrible now, and there's just too much money being spent on Mountain View Golf Course that it's a cesspool of money going down the drain because I think there's mismanagement involved. I think there's not a, accountability involved in everything that they do there to make the course better. There's a reason why HOA1 has decent golf courses, and I think there is a lot of things that they could do to improve the management of Saddlebrook and Mountain View golf courses because I think that 
there's a, there's a reason why over 20 years that the course has not improved. And I resent paying a lot of money for something that has not worked. Thank you. Thank you. John Rudine, Unit 28, Lot 65. I'm not gonna complain about anything. I love this place, okay? Been here seven years now as a snowbird. The reason I've come up here is because I've done my own analysis with information from the board. No matter what, we're gonna pay $300 a year more for five years. That's a given, yes or no on this thing. And if we vote no, there's a shortfall. And now they're gonna make that up? They're gonna make it up by increasing your dues. And guess what? Dues are the gift to them that keeps on giving. They never reduce them. It could be as much as another $300, $500 increase a year, or well, maximum of 20%, 10% is the max that can increase your dues. So it could go anywhere from $300 to $500 over the next seven to eight years. So all of a sudden, you're paying $1,500 to $2,000 or more a year to the association if you don't do this up front. My biggest idea is that this is gonna save me money if I vote yes. I, talk, I look at my pocketbook all the time, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm, not, I'm willing to pay 4,200 bucks so that eight years from now, I'm not paying $2,000 a month, a, a year rather, more in assessments. Do the math. They can improve, increase your dues up to 10% every year, in addition to 300 assessment. Add that up. It's a lot of money over five to eight years. Okay, I gotta go play golf. See ya. Thank you, John. Sherry Groupie, um, Unit 45, Lot 73. And I have a question, and it's kind of interesting following just upon the last gentleman there. And it's a question I would like to direct to Board Member Larry. What we have seen and heard over and over and over, and I thank you for all your work, but what we hear is if we vote no, we will get exactly what this gentleman said. $300 assessment and skyrocketing dues. What I'm asking you, Larry, is would there be another option? Voting this no, would there be another way that the board could come back and offer to the residents a reasonable, more modified assessment of $1,500, which would not only pay off our loan to Mountain View, but also give us another $500,000 and pay for the preserve pump. Yes. Uh, no, anyways, <laughs> I, I hope that if this is voted down, that the board would be open to discussing a one-time assessment. Now, let me tell you folks that that doesn't mean that sometime in the future, we wouldn't have to come back when it is time to do the preserve course. We want to do, Chuck and I have talked, we want to do a pause, we want to see what happens with Mountain View, we want to see if more golfers come back and all that. But let's say that Mountain View's a bust, and financially we're still having massive uh, you know, subsidies and things. If that happens, then I would, could not ever see reimagining the preserve. I can see fixing it and doing it over a period of time as the plan that we have shows it going being done from 29 and 30 and a little bit in 31. So I would follow what we paid for and self-fund it. It may mean in the future we have to come back and ask for maybe $1,000 or maybe a little more in order to do that. But until we have some of the results and see what happens with our golfers, especially those that are playing in HOA1, we have no clue. Right now, everything is a guess. So I would advocate for a one-time assessment to pay off the loan, restore some of the funds to the preserve, and then right now, half of the money going in the preserve fund is making loan payments. That only leaves a million and a half to pay for roads and everything else. God, we got almost a million dollars of roads due this year, so it doesn't leave anything for normal repairs of every other amenity we have. So that loan has to get paid off. Thank you. The, the, the other item that Larry, 
The other item that Larry referring to, and I also hope that the board, if this fails, the board will immediately take up option four. Um, that option, if passed this year, will pay off the loan. It will also keep the annual dues similar to what they are in option three, and the annual one-time assessments will be lower in option four than they would be in option three. The primary reason is because when the preserved golf course gets um, built, rebuilt in 2029, a year or two before that, all residents will be able to vote for what changes you want to see made, how much those changes will cost, and also the assessment will be voted on for the preserved golf, uh, golf course by all residents. Next up. Okay, my name is Hera Lipman and I live in Unit 15, uh, Lot 60. Uh, my household is voting no on the board's proposal. I'm urging other households to do so if they share any of my concerns about the disproportionate share of this community's resources that are being devoted to golf relative to other amenities. Um, you know, the, this board has said that selling, um, closing, or repurposing even partially our golf courses is off the table. I want to know why. Um, you know, golf is declining in the United States. Um, it's not dying. We'll always have people that want to golf here, but um, it, the proportion of people um, that are golfing in the total community is on the decline. Just so you know, when we say it's off the table, it's off the table for this board this year. For this board. Not that necessarily why, future years. That's why I say vote no and let us consider other options. I think the board is demonstrating a lack of financial responsibility vis-a-vis non-golfers. Our concerns are, and preferences are not being treated equally. Um, particularly when you say we're gonna push forward this remodel, total redesign of the preserve golf course. I don't know if it's economically advisable to do that given the decline in the number of golfers. Um, the other thing is, uh, not in this presentation, but in uh, prior presentations, the board has presented some misleading information about the impact of golf on home values. I guess I'll have to come back later because I have more Thank things you. to say. Yeah. Hello, I'm Jake Jacobson, Unit 17. I've lived here 26 years. I am not a golfer. In a previous meeting I asked and I was told that only 30% of HOA2 play golf. That means 70% do not. However, we are supposed to fund the 30% the does that make any sense to anybody that has money? You want to give your money away? Give it to a charity, at least you'll get a deduction. Here you're just getting nothing. In case you're not aware of it, if you look at the monthly report that comes out, you will find that golf is also subsidized. So when every one of these people play golf, you're paying for it. I suggest you pray for rain so they can't play. <laughs> the last thing I want to bring up is, in any election, there has to be counters from both sides. Has the board brought on counters from both sides, or will only one side count the vote. 
In any election, you're supposed to have people from both sides, and there are numerous people like me who are not in favor and will never be in favor because I don't believe that 30% should have money given to them. Also, the fact that daily golf is subsidized, which means you're getting hit twice. Once to pay for the course, and the other to pay for them to play. Golf has always been a rich person's thing, and the people who play it have golf carts, expensive clubs, and many of them may have belonged to a country club before Thank they you, got Jake. here. Thank you, Jake. Jake, you... Okay, my name is Tim Ward, uh, Unit 47, Lot 160. First of all, I want to thank all the board members for what they do for this community, a difficult and thankless job. As far as what we face, I want to thank the Finance Committee for all the effort put forth in doing these studies and using outside expertise, as well as to come to these conclusions and recommendations to secure our financial future. I, for one, am in no position to challenge the reams of data collected or to challenge the integrity of those who are presenting those conclusions. Moving to this community was a dream come true for us. Yes, golf was the number one priority, but when we saw everything that was offered as amenities, it was a no-brainer decision. We want this community to maintain the standards that made it so appealing. And golf has always been a part of this community. It's why a lot of people move here. I, they say 30, 35% of people play golf, whatever. I want to know what the percentage of the people that use the other amenities. I bet it's a lot less than 30, 35%. But thank you again. We will be voting for option three. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Denise Anthony, Unit 50, Lot 51. I'm a mathematician, and with all due respect to the RRAG and the work that they put in, I'm going back to the reserve study of 2022. There is a 264-page document where we paid consultants called reserve advisors to study and inventory every single thing we own, down to the light fixtures. They use science and they take how much life is remaining on every single one of those things. It gets prioritized so that the things that have the lowest life are handled first and the things that have a longer life are delayed. It was the 10-year plan to 2032. What we've done is paid for this advice and in December of 22, just a few months later, we took a detour off the roadmap that was given to us, and we took a loan out on Mountain View. Four months later, we took a detour on the Mesquite Grill, which had life remaining of five to ten years because we had just remodeled it. Now, in December of 2023, we're trying to take another detour from the roadmap the reserve advisors gave us. It is a science. Everything is important. I'm not going to debate that. But all in due time, based on the age. We are 25 years old as a community. All of it's aging, just like us. Okay. If you were told that your house, your roof had seven years, your air conditioner had three years, your irrigation had one year, and your pool had ten, would you do your pool first? That's what the renovation of the preserve golf course is. Thank you, Dave. Steve Wiley, Unit 14. Um, I'm going to echo sentiments of a few others, and, and anything I say is not meant to impugn the, the contribution you've seen up here. And, and I, I've been on the giving in and receiving end of several, lots of these type of presentations. And, 
And what I'm going to say is, observing the discord and the lack of consensus, I'm not going to fault individuals. I'm going to say it's probably a process problem. And, and, and in my view, a lot of us don't wake up till we get pinched. I'm one of those. And I, I, I'm about to get pinched, so I'm waking up. And I, I think the process has, has been short-sighted in putting the assumptions that all this its analysis has been based on up front and adhered to before you move on downstream. Assumptions are key. Key to any financial assessment. Uh, experts can do assessments all day long. The, the really driving thing behind the outcome of that is the assumptions it's based on. And what I hear is there's not a lot of agreement on those assumptions at this point in time. So I would go back, I'm going to vote no, and I would urge the community to go back and look for a larger visibility of those assumptions to be way upstream. All right, thank you. Michael Buckley. Unit 36, lot 36. As I said at an earlier uh, town hall meeting, the Mountain View course used to be a fairly attractive course, but now it's one of the top five ugliest courses in the state of Arizona. I don't want the preserve to ha have that happen too. And the How way do you know that, Mike? Go what? look at it. I, I look at it. I don't know about top, but how do you know top five? Okay, it's the top five that are partially operating because we don't have all 18 holes yet. And I'm directing this question to you, Dan. When you found out the onerous terms of this loan, why did you not try to convince the board to ask for an assessment last year in 1920 or 2023? And we wouldn't even be here right now talking about any of this. We would be talking about further down the road, but the golf course would not have had a loan. It would have had a short-term loan but until you got the assessment, but you would have easily talked probably Oh, well over half of the residents of Saddlebrook to vote yes on a $1,500 assessment that would pay off the, the existing loan that you had taken out at the end of 2022, signed in 2023, and also partially paid for the pump, a, a new pump. I understand there's three pumps at the Preserve Golf Course in one facility. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Um, anyway, that's, that, that's moot. But tell me why you did not try to convince the board to ask for an assessment in early 2023 when you knew that we were actually paying not a 7% loan, but over a 9% loan because of the holdbacks. Michael. Michael. I, I will make one statement before Matt talks. We talked about this at a, t at a unit meeting on Friday. Michael. We were given... Bad information, so. I, I, listen, we can't go back. First of all, you don't get to interrogate the board. Right, you can ask a question. I, I would not call that what I just said to Dan, interrogation, it's, okay. a, it's an honest question. L listen to what I'm saying, okay? What happened in 2022 happened. Okay, Dan was one of seven board members in 2022. He can't represent the collective thinking of seven board members, okay? He doesn't need to sit up here and defend that process in 2022. It happened, a vote happened. I don't know why you didn't ask Chuck the same question. Chuck was on that board, okay? I, and so what I'm telling you is, we're not gonna attack members of the board. If you wanna ask a question, we can do that. I did ask a question, and what? I didn't say, I didn't ask about 2022, I asked about 2023. After you already had the loan, you knew the owner's terms of that loan being over a 9%, effective 9% loan, and why you did not say, we need to jump on this right now, get an assessment, get that loan paid off, and save ourselves at least $500,000 for that one year. All right, Mike, thanks.
Okay, I've already introduced myself, so you I don't... Can you tell me your name again, please? Harold Lippman. Thank you. Unit 15, Lot 60. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, just continuing on this, not in this presentation, but in several, two of the earlier presentations, there was a focus on... Um, home values declining if we did not vote for the board's preferred proposal. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that is, that's misleading. Um, there is a volume of academic research, peer-reviewed studies on the impact of golf courses on home values, and that, that premium to golf lots varies widely, is highly uncertain, and it depends on a variety of factors. One important factor here is that we also have wonderful uh, mountain views. Um, but in any event, what those peer-reviewed studies say is it's only a very select group of homes that would suffer in value um, if we uh, you know, eliminated the golf courses. I mean, if we had no golf whatsoever, it would probably affect home values. But people can still golf here. Um, the other thing that those studies say is that if you put in a park, for instance, a beautiful park, that it affects a much wider range of homes. And the reason for this is in a golf course, there's lack of access. You know, people that want to jog or walk or daydream on the park uh, or uh, on the golf course, you know, th they're actively discouraged from doing so. What I want to propose really quickly is in the future, we vote no and we consider repurposing <clears throat> um, one of those golf courses on a partial basis. All right, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Another purpose, like a park. Let me just make sure you understand. The question you're asking, the questions that you're referring to, were referred to in prior presentations. I think uh, Campbell put a presentation on in January to that very subject with lots of footnotes of places you can go and read specifics associated to closing a golf course, repurposing a golf course. Those studies were done. So I. I please go back and look at that presentation because there was a lot of work done on that. This isn't something that was just said, nobody thought about. There was a lot of work done on it. And I appreciate your opinion of that, but there's also the work that was done earlier. Thank you. Duff Fletcher, Unit 15. Everybody talks about the number of golfers, but there's another element in here. It's not only the number of golfers, it's also the people that use the golf course by virtue of living on it. Think about that. Think about those folks. I don't play golf. I don't live on a golf course. But I also think about the greater community, and that includes the golfers. It also includes the people that paid significant money to buy a lot on the golf course. Thank you, Duff. Hello, my name is Paige Zanuck, Unit 47, Lot 130. Uh, we're gonna vote yes on option three, and um, I'm, I'm thinking that everyone who moved to Saddlebrook knew there were golf courses here, even if they don't play, and golf courses are expensive, they just are. I also know, I also know that um, there were two board seats open at, at the end of the December last year and, on, and only three people ran for the board. And I hate to be disrespectful, but I want to say, how is the view from the cheap seats? Um, the other thing that I have to say is with respect to trying to divide the board in this presentation in front of all of us. I don't think that's appropriate. We're being asked to vote on option one, two, or three. And I think for board members to specify, 
we are being asked to vote on option one, two, or three, and we're not being told what a possible option four is until it just... Okay. My mistake. I misunderstood. But I don't want to see the board divided up here. When we're at a meeting, I just feel like the board should prevent it, present a unified front. I don't think either of you are up for re-election anytime soon. Um, and it seemed like there was some campaigning. So <laughs> thank you for my, uh, thank you for my time. Thanks, Paige. Good afternoon, Alan Grotsky, Unit 23. This question is for you, Matt. I just need a clarification. Earlier, when people started asking questions, <clears throat> you were asked if you, um, in your conversations... Alan, talking to the mic, please. I said I needed clarification with respect to a question that I think was posed to you. <clears throat> Specifically, did you ask RCI to vote yes on option three? I can answer that question. Yes, I asked them to vote. They're selling 100 future homes in the preserve. Sustaining the golf course up there is an essential asset in that, in that uh, asset basket for, for them. I tried to make the case that it was in their best interest to preserve the long-term viability of the preserve golf course. Let me tell you why I asked that question. I believe the gentleman who was the head of the election committee said that from past history, we get approximately 40% turnout for the vote. If RCI goes ahead and votes, there are 318 lots. And if 100% voted, we would have to get over 55% of the vote. Taking that one step further, if we get somewhere around 50% of the vote, that means we're going to get, need over 60% for people to vote no to turn this down. It doesn't seem to me that it's in the best interest of this community. And if you, oh, if you continually tell us that this board represents all HOA2 residents, it seems to me that by you recommending to RCI that they vote yes doesn't represent me or a number of other people here. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Alan, that's a great observation. The only thing you're missing is the board's working for the best interest of all homeowners, not your personal opinions. Let me, <clears throat> let me come back on this. I was going to get there eventually. Obviously, not soon enough. You talk about golf. Golf is supported by the golfers. Every single one of us, or any of you that play, are paying. $4,200 $4, to play for one year. That's almost $450,000. We lost 130 golfers to HOA1 for whatever reason, which I know about, but I'm not gonna go into. That 130, if they were playing here, would be another $550,000 per year. I mean, we support it. I don't care. If you don't play golf, you don't pay for it. Pure and simple. And we talk about dues. You go ahead and you have, you go ahead, if, hey, you go ahead and if you could talk about dues between HOA1 and HOA2, it costs more in, in, to go ahead and maintain 18 holes of golf than it does for, tw excuse me, 36 holes than it does for 27. Number two. The dues, and we have a reciprocal agreement with HOA1. We provide the enemy, the uh, amenities. They go ahead and have access to them. They don't pay you for them. So I mean, their dues are gonna be lower than ours. And the part that I started to say earlier, I see these flyers coming out. I see people talking against what is going on. We're looking for the future. We're not looking for now or a year from now. We've got new people coming in that want to take care, uh, part in our amenities, and that includes 
playing golf out there. But golf isn't the answer to what you're talking. My wife told me the other day, and I was going to lead on to it, we're in a boat that has a hole in the bottom, and it's sinking. And slowly but surely, it's going to go ahead and sink completely. We're paying attention to the steering of the boat instead of saving it. So Thanks. let's go ahead and do the right thing. Thanks, Hank. Thank you. My name is John Sohikian. I'm in Unit 45, Lot 77. So the, the community, we're part of a group that urges the community to vote no. The reason for that is multifold, but only in two minutes. Only 11% of our community plays golf on a regular basis. 310 or so biannual passes, and another 410 packs the 1500 number that you hear that adds a bunch of other casual golfers. When you start to think about the fact that this board, first it was the golf committee that voted to spend 6.9 million to renovate the Mountain View course with none of us having a say in that. And now we're being asked to spend 9.5 million and these meetings, three town halls, unit meetings, they've all been the same. They tell us they're listening to us, but they're not. Because if they were, they would sit back and think about what we're saying and they would alter their plan. So what we have suggested is that we vote no, we go back, we look at another option, we'll pay off the loan, which we have to do. We weren't asked to take out that loan at 7%, but we should pay it off because it's prudent. And then we can look, as Larry and Chuck have mentioned, at a prudent approach to approach the preserve course. We are an adult community that offers many amenities, including golf. We are not a golf country club. So there is 75% of us that do not play golf. And I can be honest with you, if one of our golf courses is made into a park, your home values would not go down because you'd have walking paths, cycling paths, community gardens, a lot of great use for that land. And at some point, when the Generation X and Millennials come here, that's what's going to happen because golf will not be sustainable at the rate it is right now. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. John, uh, John, 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 hang on just a second. I just want to make one little point with you. Uh, I respect what you're saying, I uh, certainly do. But in um, 2023, no, no, I'm sorry, 2022, November 18th, I believe, 2022, the board met um, and had an agenda, and the vote for the approval of the Mountain View loan was on that agenda. And that occurred. It, it did occur. Uh, the board voted. During that process, during that process, John, there were requests for members' comments at that board meeting. I don't know how many people showed up. It certainly probably wasn't as many as here. There was no one that walked up and said anything about that board vote from the uh, audience the only person that actually said anything about it was, um, that had a question was Chuck about the ability to pay that loan off. So the idea that it's a surprise or that it was done usurpiously really isn't much respect for prior boards and the work they did to explain that process. So please go back, uh, November 18th, I think it's 2022, November 18th, there's a video of it on YouTube, you can watch it. But that process worked, and I, it wasn't hidden from anybody. And in fact, there was very few people even ever talked about it. So anyway, just wanted to tell you that there was no usurpious part. But I respect what you're saying, I really do. Uh, but please at least give us a little bit of help here on that side. Thank you, John. Yep, I, no problem. I think John's point is, I think when the board approves something as high as $6 million or $9.5 million, 
and they want an assessment sent out for that, there ought to be a vote of the community to see if they want that thing paid and they want the funds out of the reserve to go after that. We shouldn't just sit there and take money out. And I think that's one of the concerns they have over option three is because once that's approved and $9 million, $15 million goes into the pot of reserves, the board has complete carte blanche to do it, whatever they want with that money without a vote of the community. And I don't think that's what the community wants. That's right. Let me, let me just do a quick debate here real quick with Chuck. I'll remind you, Chuck, that you are on that board. And the only question that you asked during that process, and it's, I, I didn't, can remember, I've been in a million meetings since then, but the only question you asked was whether you could pay off the loan early or not with no penalty. That was it. You're, you're correct. Yeah, I, I, but I, I know mean, a lot not, more now than I knew then. This is my third year okay, on the board. Well, if you're different now, that's okay. I, I respect am. that. But, you know, let's not throw hay on the boards in the past because we didn't happen to ask at that point in time. At that point in time, I was told we didn't have a choice in the matter. We had to vote for the loan because they didn't feel that the assessment would pass. Okay, I, I don't know that because that wasn't on the beating. Go ahead, I'm sorry. My name is Les Goins. I'm in Unit 31, hey, Lot 15. Unit 31, Lot 15. About now. Close enough? I have to touch it. <laughs> okay. Uh, it has to do with a, a comment by the president. Les Goins, Unit 31, Lot 15. And it has to do with a comment by the president about the 40% possible voting in the, in the past as far as uh, any of the other resolutions have been asked about. Do we have some way, uh, prior to the final decision day of April 30th or whatever, of putting some sort of a tabulation up that shows who has voted, and whether in fact you can look and see, did your vote count? Or in fact you might see that your vote was attributed to you and you didn't count. With the whole thought of trying to uh, alleviate or the possible work away from the idea that you get the vote and then people start griping and moaning about the fact that there was some lack of transparency, it really didn't account for it, yada, yada, yada. Do we have some way of letting people know that they did vote or that there was a vote counted uh, attributed to them that really didn't matter. Do we have no. any way of doing it? <clears throat> Let me answer that real quick. Um, good. Oh, Cash, you gonna? This is one of the election committee members. I'm on the election committee and have been for five years. The electronic voting is the absolute most secure because there is no way for us on the committee to know who voted for what. There, it is not provided to us during the vote or after the vote or we're not even able to ask for it. When you send your envelope in, we take the vote, the ballot out of it and it's counted by three different ways. So it's no, the answer to your question is, is there any way to know how much is what? Not until Charlie pushes the last punch. It all shows how many pro and how many against. And uh, we then take the hand ballots triple count them and add those to it and provide that to the president of the board. Thank you. Thank you, Cash, for coming up. Andrea Mulberging, again, Unit 42, Unit 28. Um, I'm wondering, is the, as if we vote yes or no, is it, it's a based on a payment plan with the assumption that 9.5 million is going to the preserve renovation. That's what I need to understand. Is that inherently part of what we are voting on? Yes. Okay. So if I vote no, I'm saying I don't think that using 9.5 million to renovate the preserve course in 27 is a fiscally responsible thing to do. Yes. That's why I'm voting no. Actually, Andrea, just real quick, um, it is, the, yes is the answer, but the reality is we're dealing with a $15 million shortfall. It's not just, just one thing, so. Okay, some right now. Okay. Okay. 
I understand. I, that's what you said here, so I get it. Thanks. Come on down. Oh, hi, Paige, Paige Zanuck, uh, lot, sorry, Unit 47, Lot 130. Um, not for the preserve being turned into a park, because as a golf course, we get revenue from the course. A park would require a lot of expensive maintenance. I'm assuming grass, which would need to be watered. Um, you can't just let it go to desert because then it's just a wilderness and people's property values will go down. Uh, so I just think a park brings in no revenue and a golf course does bring in revenue. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. I'm Mike Lewis uh, with uh, Unit 40. Right mic, Mike. Mike Lewis, Unit uh, 49, Lot 7. Right. Pull it up. Uh, lot 49, you, you, <laughs> Unit uh, 49, Lot 79. Uh, I have a question of kind of a, an inconvenient truth of Option 3. And uh, I was at a presentation where Ray, Assistant General Manager, was discussing our roads and the condition of our roads. And we have 51 miles of roads that we're responsible for. And those roads are woefully constructed. In fact, so badly constructed that it appears that the county Pinal County, and we pay taxes in the village of Pinal County, right? They won't take our roads because of how bad a condition they are. I have a background in risk management. I was a risk manager for city of Portland, Oregon. And to me, the single largest exposure that we face going forward is not the preserve. It's not Mountain View. It's keeping our roads up. And so when you start talking about uh, unknowns, you just had two or three hundred feet up in, uh, up in the preserve go bad. Now what the hell, where's the money going to come from if you have, you have a series of those and for unknown reasons you've got to start replacing roads. Don't tell me there's not going to be an assessment in the future after you've collected this. John, John. John, Mike. John, or oh, Mike. Mike. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm sorry. I called you John. I um, just want to tell you the the county comment that you made, somewhat accurate. The reason they wouldn't take our roads is they weren't built to county specifications originally, and that comes in a lot of pieces and parts, uh, width and maybe the compaction and maybe the asphalt. I don't know. But it wasn't because they're all worn out now. That really wasn't the issue. What, what I heard from Ray was that from Ray. for 51 miles of road to repave, it's one million bucks per mile. Absolutely, and you're exactly that right. That doesn't include compaction, and the That's, issue really is lousy compaction. Right. No, you're exactly right. But I will tell you. No, hang on. Those roads are in the reserve study. We hire a consultant every three years, I believe, to do a road study. That's all they do. Right. But but part of every year's reserve fund is to take care of roads. It's in the it's in the yearly reserve funds. So we do have the three million floor, and that's what's used in the catastrophic needs, if you will. If you have a ton of catastrophic needs, obviously that's not enough. So there's no question that what you are suggesting is correct. I just wanted to clarify the county wasn't about our roads in bad shape. It was the roads were never constructed to county standards originally. So ropes and did them to hold on to private roads. So I don't know, that's just a clarification. Sorry. Hello, I'm Jake Jacobson, Unit 17. I just want to correct one thing. Somebody questioned where I came up with the 30% play golf. I asked the question at one of the other hearings, and the board told me that 30% play golf. So I didn't come up with this figure out of the sky. 
Thank you. Jake, I didn't question it because I told you the answer. Originally, it is 30%. And the reason it's 30% was surveys are taken pretty much every year. The number, the name of exact people that play on the two golf courses we own that are homeowners in HOA2, you take those numbers, they're roughly somewhere around 1650 to 1720 names, individual names that play on our two golf courses every year. That, when you divide it into the total number of names that live here, is about 30%. So that's where that comes from. So you. you're welcome, Jake. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Leslie Van Hoff. I'm Unit 17, Lot 52. Uh, I came here pretty much convinced to vote for option three. And I wanted to take a, just a minute to thank all the board and everybody else that's worked so hard on this because I know what you've been going through. Um, and we appreciate, there's a lot of people out there that appreciate it. Um, my question is, there's been a lot of talk now about an option four um, with a $1,500 assessment. What my question is, I know that we're supposed to vote now, so would there be time in this year to approve option four and still um, make that assessment happen this year and, and make the loan payment that we want to pay. I think um, I'll answer it, Matt. You may want to chime in as well. But um, the reality is this board, and we voted five to zero, um, to believe that option three is the best option for our homeowners. So we're focused on providing that option to our homeowners, and now homeowners get to vote on that option. What happens after that, plus or minus, either way, is a whole new conversation for this board. But right now, what is in front of us as a community is to decide how you want to have your opinion of option three or the $4,200 uh, $4, assessment. So that's what's going on short term. What happens after that, who knows? I mean, I can't tell you. However, that. there would be time this year. There you go. You guys worn out yet? <laughs> uh, Mona Devine, Unit 45, Lot 100. Um, I hope going forward, whether it's a yes or no, that the community will st still support golf as an amenity. I think it brings value to homes, brings value to the community, but we also need to be uh, maybe restrained in our spending. I think there's a lot of savings that we can do in the $9 million plan. Uh, I think, Matt, you said you learned maybe more up front would have been helpful, and it probably would have been. Um, I did confirm today something that I had known but wasn't quite sure. But for instance, HOA1 does their, did their bunkers themselves over time while the course was still open. Pump can be done phased, bunkers, I know it's easier to do it all at once. But if it does end up being a no vote, I hope that the board can go forward with it. And I hope the community can still support golf and really take a look at how we're spending on that project and make sure we make it as cost efficient as possible. Thank you. Thanks, Mona. Mona, that's one of the reasons we want to pause to find out exactly what HOA1 does because they were able to do their 27 holes in substantially less than nine and a half million dollars. And one of the reasons is, is what you said, they took care of their bunkers by themselves over a period of years, over in a, uh, a slow season. And also, I think we talked to their head of uh, maintenance over there, and they didn't spend anywhere near $400,000 for an architect to redesign their courses. Brad Nickham, Unit 28, uh, lot, uh, lot 74. Um, Matt, you look like you need a hug right now. <laughs> um, the reason why I will vote yes, it's not about golf. It's about getting some degree of certainty. 
there's a million variables that have gone on and Campbell, Matt, Dan, the whole, everybody have worked on for months. And it's not precise and it can't be precise. What I don't like about some of what I'm hearing here today and in previous meetings is what about this, what about this? Changing the nature of major assets. Imagine how that comes across to someone who's trying to sell a hundred lots at a million and a half dollars per home. Imagine how that sounds to the buyer that maybe wants to buy your house at the point in time when you will have to sell or I have to sell. What they're offering, it's not certainty, there's a lot of uncertainty, but what they're offering is a reasonable game plan and the difference between $4,200 and $1,500 or $300 over X number of years, option three cuts it clean. May 1st, we know what the heck we're doing and you don't have the degree of uncertainty. Uncertainty is our biggest enemy, whether you're a golfer or not. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. George Delzell. Sorry, you, your last name again, please. Delzell. Uh, I live in uh, Unit 15, Lot 60. And uh, I, I, I must have misunderstood you. Did you say that Robeson gets three votes per lot? Yes. And we get one? Mm -hmm. That's equal. Okay. Uh, so since 2008, 1,500 golf courses have closed down through the United States. Golf is declining on TV every year. But I do not want to get rid of the golf courses. I would like to keep them here. It's an asset. But if I can use it, it's an asset to me. If you play golf one day and then let me have access to it the next day and keep alternating, there's plenty of room for everyone. And we can keep the beauty of Saddlebrook the way it is now. And also improve the values of homes four blocks away from the golf courses. That's what parks do. Golf houses, homes on golf courses are the only ones that benefit from the golf course, their prices. I think that we can come up with a solution to benefit everyone. And I don't envy your jobs. I uh, appreciate your work and thank you for letting me speak. All right, George, thank you. Uh, Kirk Donovan, um, Unit 30, Lot 8. The gentleman, the last two gentlemen kind of echoed what I was going to say. Uh, nobody drove into Saddlebrook and didn't see the golf courses when you bought a house here. It's part of who we are, it's part of what we have. Before we moved here, we went over to Bullhead City and spent a few days and looked around and drove across the bridge to Laughlin. Drive over there, go across the bridge to Laughlin and drive about 10 minutes farther into Nevada and you will see an abandoned golf course. It is absolutely disgusting. Nobody's built a park there, nobody's got a garden there. It will be a mess. It will, we, yeah, we wouldn't do that. We know better, we know better, no. The point is, what that gentleman said is, this is not a perfect plan. I've heard it two or three times now. But we don't need the uncertainty moving forward. You wanna drive down housing prices, have another year of this kind of division and debate and undecision. Let's not be like Congress and kick the can down the road. Let's solve the problem, let's move ahead, let's fine tune it as we can, let's stay in touch. 
But how about we not be like the rest of the country and let's be a little bit unified here and work with our neighbors, care for our neighbors, love our neighbors, talk kindly and disagree, but let's deal with what we have and let's move ahead with some certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Nick Nicholas, excuse me, um, Unit 32, Lot 10. And this concerns the statement in regard to what you were saying earlier, Matt, in regard to um, the lots that are being sold up and preserved, and that if you buy after July 5th, certain date, you don't have to pay the assessment? Aren't they going to be benefiting from the same things that everybody else is? Yes, sir. I'm not a lawyer. It has to do with when the assessment is levied and what an accessible property is. If you don't own a property on the date that the assessment is levied and you take ownership after that date, you cannot be uh, charged with that assessment. All right, thanks. Seeking a compromise, since only 30% play golf and 70% do not, why not have the 30% pay 70% of the cost? And the 30% be paid by the 70% who do not play golf. That would be very fair. Thanks, Jack. I, I, Jake, I, I think we've got your message. We've, uh, we've heard that, I think. I think. Barry Swartzberg, Unit 17, Lot 193. Matt, I'm really glad that you directly answered that question about asking Robeson to vote yes. This community, it should be a resident's vote. He shouldn't have, he doesn't have any skin in the game. He's not being assessed anything per lot. You've got two people on this board who are not in favor of this assessment, and yet you are representing a community when you told him or asked him to vote yes. That's disingenuous. You should probably resign from this board. Barry, let me ask you, Barry. Barry, let me, uh, let me make a comment to you, okay? This yes. board voted five to zero to offer up option three, five to zero. These two gentlemen voted nothing. They abstain. So the majority of this board voted. So don't be uh, suggesting that this board was not united in this approach, because it is. So I really- I'm talking about the residents, Dan. I, I get not it, but you just, you just said something about the board not being united. I think, I think today, you, Larry and Chuck proved that they were not in favor of this assessment and that they would prefer a different option. Okay. Option four, which we've suggested wow. okay. there should be another option. I get it. Thank you. You're welcome. And vote no. Just, Dan, just to be clear, we abstained because we did not agree with the process that went through um, when we came up with the option three. And if we would have went through and said no, we would, we would have agreed with the process. We did not agree with it. Okay. Was it 5-0, Chuck? Was it 5-0? Okay. Thank you. That was the result of the vote. There are seven people on the board. Okay. Okay. No more questions? I adjourn this town hall. Thank you.